Good evening. This is an exciting time to be living, and I trust that each and every one of you that are tuning into tonight's show and uh, watching the recording that we will be hearing from you, and that you are just as excited about the future as I am. Uh, last night we talked about the power of the seed, I guess, <laughs> because the title was after after success. No, it wasn't after struggle or beyond struggle and uh, it's a very interesting topic because it's got people talking and people are uh, thinking about things that they haven't thought about before and you know tonight i just want to say that um, i am the kind of person who wants to question things question everything you know why do you do the things the way you do them <laughs> Who said this was the rule? Uh, what are the what are the ba what's the basis for your belief or value? And these are questions that I'd like to ask myself to under seek to understand how life was set up to operate. You know, some people think the foundation for everything is finances. Well, the I've learned as an engineer the foundation is a very very important part of a building. The taller the building, the deeper the foundation. So if you believe money is the foundation for everything, <laughs> the, the more money you have, the bigger the thing is that you can build. But if you have an alternative foundation, something that is way beyond anything that money can ever buy, that foundation is worth investing in. And uh, we want to explore different things in life that enable us to have a real impact in the hearts and minds of others. I think, like me, you are wanting to live a full life, one that is that you can declare is a life that has been emptied out, a life that has been poured out, where you have given your gift away fully and completely in such a way that that which you were sent to start has begun and will perpetuate long after you are gone. And uh, tonight we're going to have a very uh, interesting talk where Terence Ogle uh, is going to talk about five important questions that you and I should be asking. It's not the only five, the only questions that are out there, but these are really five key questions that we can begin to ask in our own life and probably have started or will definitely ask in the future. So I'm eager to hear Terence's message and immediately afterwards we'll have a, a short chat and I'll be ready to answer any questions and to listen to your insights. Let's hand over to Terence. My name is Terence Ogle, uh, based here in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I'm a partner uh, at the Map for Life Institute. My talk today is entitled Five Key Questions Which I Believe Are Critical and Which At Some Point in Our Lives We Need to Address. So I invite you to join me in the next 10 minutes or so on a journey of introspection, on a journey on discovery of who we are um, and what we are here for. I have aligned these five questions to the five steps of the Map for Life methodology. The first step in the Map for Life methodology is establish your position. And the tool that's used to help one to do this is called the Wheel of Life. Now, if you embark on a journey, the first thing one needs to know is to where you're at at the moment, your current position, before then determining in which direction you will proceed. 
So the wheel of life, at the very hub of the of the wheel, um, has the labels of core beliefs and values. And if one considers the components of a normal wheel, inside of the hub are what we call ball bearings, which enable the wheel to turn smoothly. If any one of these bearings is damaged in some way, the wheel will not operate optimally. In fact, it will not operate. Similarly in life, our core beliefs and our values guide us to lead the best life that we possibly can. And if our beliefs and values are out of kilter, we will lead dysfunctional lives. So it's important that our core values and our beliefs are sound and are stable. So the first question, which fits neatly into the hub is, who am I? This question relates to identity. And you may at first uh, find this strange. The obvious answer to which in my case would be, I am Terence Ogle, I'm a husband, a father, a grandfather, I live in Johannesburg, South Africa, etc. I am reminded at this point of a brilliant Joko tea ad in which a prominent South African politician approaches an airport um, boarding counter, presents his ticket to the attendant who has a look at it, and clearly by the expression uh, on her face, finds something amiss with the ticket. The politician becomes agitated and shouts out, do you know who I am? The attendant calmly takes a sip of a Joko tea, um, reaches to the public intercom microphone next to her, and calmly announces, ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. At counter 13, I have a gentleman who does not know who he is. If anyone can assist, please come to counter 13. Now, I'm not talking about this type of counter 13 identity, which is a largely assumed identity. It's an identity that's been given to you by uh, virtue of your rank or your position or your standing in life. I am talking here of a much deeper level of identity, an identity de derived from deep introspection and questions such as, do I believe in a creator? If so, what is the nature of my creator? Are there any expectations placed on me by my creator? Do I believe that I am made of body, mind, and spirit. What happens to me after death? What are my views on eternity? And so on and so on. As one ponders these deep questions, the answers will not come necessarily quickly and easily, but we will develop and appreciate a deeper sense of who we are, who we are really. And this will put us in a very good position to then ask the second key question and that question is why am i here and this question talks specifically to purpose the reason i have been created or the need i have been created to meet speaks to my purpose and as much as we are unique human beings we each have a unique purpose in other words you and i are created for a purpose that only you and I can fulfill. So how does one go about finding one's purpose in life? You may ask a very relevant question. And here are a few pointers. Search inwards for purpose. We are born with it. We don't inherit it from others. Focus on what you have, your gifts and your talents. Think about what brings you joy. What would you be prepared to do every day of your life, even without getting paid? Take ownership of your life. Only you can live out your purpose. Others can advise and guide you on what they see in you. But ultimately, only you can live out your life. Discovering one's purpose is a journey, not an 
an event. Don't overcomplicate the process of finding your purpose. Just ask the right questions and follow your heart. I read an interesting comment on purpose recently, and it reads as follows, and I quote, Individual with, individuals with a strong sense of purpose tend to live longer, have healthier hearts, and are more psycholo psychologically resilient. So individuals with a strong sense of purpose tend to live longer, have healthier hearts, and are more psychologically resilient. I don't know about you, but I could certainly do with all of the above. The second step in the Map for Life methodology is determine your destination. Having understood one's current position, established one's identity, and discovered one's purpose, it is then time for one to set off and take the necessary action steps to realize that purpose. So what does the end state look like? I love this stage as it allows one to dream as big as one's heart's desires are. So the question at this stage is, where am I going? And this question speaks specifically to vision and vision casting. The ability to look into the future and see the end state. If one considers that everything that has been created was first a thought, it becomes extremely important that our dreams are processed through our mental faculties. The more we process them, the more we act on them, and the more of a reality they become. There are many examples of great leaders who have compelling visions. And here are just a few examples. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. encapsulated his vision in his famous I Have a Dream speech of 1963. He ended his speech with the title of a spiritual, uh, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. His clarity, his passion in delivering that speech naturally drew people to a common vision, freedom. A year later on a different continent, another great leader delivered a passionate speech during what was known as the Rivonia trial in Johannesburg, South Africa. Nelson Mandela's closing remarks were, I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Again, a good example of a clear, concise, precise vision um, statement, leaving no doubt in the listener's mind of the future desired state. And lastly, in 1978, a school in a school classroom in the town of East London, South Africa, a seed to map the world was planted in the mind of a young boy. As that seed was nurtured over the years, it culminated in the formation of the Map for Life Institute in 1999. That young boy was none other than the founder of Map for Life, Glenn McQuirk. His purpose to map the world, his vision, world transformation, his vision, this mission, Make Life Purposeful. Map for Life has impacted thousands of lives across the globe and continues to make positive inroads globally, all driven by a passionate, focused, and intentional leader. A few attributes of a great vision statement. A vision statement must be distinctive. It must be specific. A vision statement must, must engage both hearts and mind. It must be aligned to core beliefs, values, and purpose. It must be both inspirational and aspirational. It must use vivid imagery and a compelling picture of the future. So, having established my current position, understanding what my purpose is, and having this vision of the future, what is the next question? 
So the fourth question is, how do I get there? How do I get to this place, this vision that I've painted for myself, for my life? The third, third step in the Maphylite methodology is to develop a plan to get from point A, current position, to point B, the desired destination. Here, the map for life uh, methodology is very detailed on how to set goals, develop healthy habits, and pursue one's purpose, all to assist one on one's exciting journey. The fifth and the final question is, what next? This is not so much a question as a call to action. A dream, a vision, a plan without action remains but a dream. What, import, what is important to note about this action step is that it is a process that happens over time. We do not seek perfection, but progress. One step at a time, one day at a time, as we journey towards our vision. So in summary, five key life questions. Who am I? speaks to identity. Why am I here? speaks to purpose. Where am I heading? speaks to vision. How do I get there? speaks to a plan. What next? speaks to taking action. Allow me to conclude with a beautiful quote from Carly Fiorina, the CEO of Hewlett Placard from 1999 to 2002. And it's taken from her book entitled, Find Your Way, Unleash Your Power and Highest Potential. And I quote, no matter where you are in life right now, and no matter where you've been, you are not yet all you can be. I'll repeat that quote. No matter where you are in life right now, and no matter, no matter where you've been, you are not yet all you can be. To paraphrase, regardless of your past, regardless of where you're at at the moment, your dream is valid. I wish you well on your exhilarating journey of fulfillment and ultimate significance. I thank you. Well, thank you so much, Terence. It was an exciting, exciting session. It's such a valuable set of questions that you and I can ask. Uh, Terence, thank you so much for putting that together. I think this is going to be one of those go-to go -to messages uh, to help people to move forward in becoming fully who they were born to be. And so the questions, again, just for uh, clarity is, who am I? talking about identity and I think this is a very important question to that we think about uh, people think about it all the time um, you know it's it kind of ties in so well with this whole uh, of with question two which is uh, why am I here and um, as as Terence and I have spoken in the past we, we've come to conclude that the question why am I here? is one that everybody asks, but there's a statement that is far more powerful that we can make, which changes our mindset completely and puts our heart in the right place. And that is just the opposite. Instead of saying, why am I here? Make the declaration, here I am. <laughs> and when you say, here I am, when you submit to a greater or higher power, it's at that moment that you start re re receiving clarity of, purpose. The next question, where am I going? And that talks very clearly of vision. And uh, I can uh, imagine people looking at me right now seeing spectacles. <laughs> I've been wearing them for over 50 years. So I know what it's like to have a to have poor sight. But I can tell you that my ability to see into the future will astonish you. I can see things beyond the present. And, uh, I, you know, we all have that ability, and it's called imagination. Um, I think it's important that we begin to follow a simple little recipe, and that is to ask, 
and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open unto you. I think these three keys are something worth looking at. You know, when you ask and it says you will receive, the question is what's important because the question provides the answer. So if you know what answer you're looking for, that will help you define the question. And I think a lot of people don't know what answer they're looking for. And as a consequence, they ask any old question. Let's get clarity in what we're asking for. Or sorry, what we want to receive so that the question can be reframed to provide that answer. And of course, when you seek, you usually seek in a place where you expect to find something. So if people are looking for oil, <laughs> they will drill in places where they expect to find oil. Similarly, if they're going to mine for gold, they will do exploration in rock formations where they expect to find gold. So your treasure is needs to be clearly defined so that you can begin to look in the right places. And you know something Miles Monroe said to me one day that your future does not lie ahead of you. It lies within you. So maybe the very purpose that you are looking in the world to identify is staring you straight in the face. It's right there. It's inside of you. Just listen to your heart as my grandmother used to say. And of course, yesterday, Elon Musk at his shareholders meeting was asked the question, what advice <laughs> would you give your children in this new era that we're moving into of, of AI? And he said, well, we're not in a new era of AI. We're actually entering into the era where purpose is important. And he talked about the idea of following your heart doing something that leads to fulfillment, meeting a need in society that gives you a sense of meaning, something that excites you to wake up in the morning. And, you know, that advice is, is sound advice. And I would encourage you to start connecting with your passion, uh, your passion today. And then finally, the last two points that he talked about, sorry, last three was, where am I going? How do I get there? And what next? Map for Life was designed specifically to help you with these questions and to uh, equip you to put together a master action plan for your life. Uh, we, we're busy looking at uh, re, re uh, uh, or rather, uploading our new website. And uh, on that new website, the landing page simply says, map the way forward. And I think there are many, many people who have used those words in boardrooms in the past. <laughs> They've talked about mapping the way forward. They know there's a methodology that should be followed, but they've not had the structured method that Map for Life provides. So I would encourage you to get yourself a copy of Map for Life. Uh, you know, talk to Terence. You can connect to Terence uh, on his homepage <laughs> if you like. And what's interesting is when you when you connect with him, you will be able to. Uh, um, how would I how would I put it? Uh, he'll be able to guide you in the in this particular area. So I encourage you to to follow and to. Uh, talk to Terence, get some guidance in terms of these five questions. So just very quickly, I'm going to show you a short little video uh, relating to Map for Life. And uh, after that, I'm going to welcome Mick into the, the studio. And I'm sure Mick has a few things that he would like to, <laughs> to chat to me about. And I look forward to that. So here's just a quick video that gives you an overview um, or in fact, I'm going to I'm going to share Miguel Miguel from Spain. He's just going to share a little message with you about Map for Life. Muy buenos días a todos. I am Miguel Sanz from Madrid, Spain. I started using Map for Life back in 2016, where this picture here, where I am with Glenn, belong to that year in the training I did in Pretoria, and. You know, there are many talks 
many, many talks out there in internet, uh, in, in, in real life, where great speakers tell you that uh, you are unique, that you need to find your purpose, what you need to do in life. You end up out of those talks really happy, but naked because you have no tools. What's Map for Life? Map for Life gives you the tools to achieve your goals, to be precise, to do all the things you need to do to achieve them. You are unique. Be mapped. Great. Thank you so much, Miguel. You know, um, I just remember back in 2016 when Miguel, Miguel joined us here in Pretoria, South Africa, uh, December 2016, and it was just such a pleasure to have him uh, being part of that session. Um, with me right now is uh, Mick, and uh, Mick is joining us. Uh, so, Mick, I'm, I'm ready to hear your story. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, Mick McGrew well. here, tuning in from Ireland. Um, Fantastic. Obviously, obviously I'm, le I'm very late getting on, um, so I kind of missed the whole thing, you know, so I don't really... What would you well, like? Mick, why, why, didn't, why, didn't you, why didn't you just quickly introduce yourself and how you got to hear about Map for Life? Okay, so my name is Mick McQuillan. Uh, I'm tuning in from the, the, the Emerald Isle, um, the Republic of Ireland. Uh, and of course, uh, it was a good friend of mine, uh, Heather King, introduced me to Map for Life. And of course, Heather hosts a call every Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. Um, UK and Ireland time, which I think might be 8 a.m. South Africa time. Pretty sure of that. Uh, and of course, it's uh, it's filled with great guests and great content, and um, yeah, it's a good learning experience. You know something, uh, Mick. I I remember when um, uh, it was in 2021, or in fact, I could go I could go further back than that uh, to the year 2001. I did a training in Cape Town, and um, uh, Heather tells me her brother attended that training and used to talk to them about it and um, eventually went to, uh, in 2016, I think it was, she she visited Cape Town and she went to a place called Bikini Beach. And um, at Bikini Beach was a bookstore where she found a copy of Map for Life. And what was interesting is in 2021, I asked her to uh, share a short story with a group of people I was training in Cape Town. And the night before she was due to share her message, I went for a drive to take a photograph of the sunset. <laughs> and I, I was taking this photograph of the sunset and I turned around and took a photograph of the shops behind me just to orientate uh, or to locate my position. I went back and uh, the next day she relayed the story about the Bikini, book, Bikini Beach bookstore. And the photograph that I had taken to orientate myself was a photograph of the Bikini Beach bookstore. Just an amazing, uh, one of those things that sometimes people say coincidence. Well, I don't believe in those things anymore. But uh, Mick, it's so wonderful to have you, have you joining. And I, I was um, privileged to see you for the first time uh, about a week ago on a Tuesday morning when you were having your Map Cafe. And... Um, I'm sure you've been attending uh, a number of those and been learning a few exciting things in terms of the mentorship program that we have. Uh, what would you say is your, your greatest take home from the, the uh, Tuesday morning sessions? Well, I think that, I don't know what, I don't know whether it would be the, the well, it possibly could be the greatest takeaway is the, the, the community, the, the like-mindedness, the, the, the wanting of betterment, if you like, um, uh, to be better. Um, and, and I think Heather would probably testify that probably Tuesday is probably the most enriched day for everybody um, because we're up early. Um, you know, we, we, we're very positive you know, after the call, we probably get more done on a Tuesday than any other day. Um, so I think I think being around like minded people who are focused on creating a higher self-awareness or consciousness 
and and focused. In fact, one of the things that, that I suppose that I heard, that I learned from Heather in the early, in in the very early stages is something that 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 she says or that she said to me, and that was to shine in your service to others, and that's kind of stuck with me. And I can see you know how Heather practices that. And I've got great admiration for Heather, um, you know, and if I could be a little bit more like her, um, I think I'm a little bit rough around the edges. She's like a diamond. I'm still rough. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I do. I learn a lot from Heather for sure. So, but it, it's, it's definitely the community and it's, uh, and, and Heather's a, a very good leader in that sense. You know something, I, um, Nick, I, um, what I find interesting is the, in, in support of what you're saying is the relationship building um, and that sense of belonging uh, and and the just just the freedom to actually share your thoughts and ideas in a in a safe environment um, where your ideas or your thoughts trigger other people's thoughts and ideas and it actually ends up being a very encouraging uh, discussion and I've I found uh, you know I I tend nine of these uh, map cafe sessions each week in the mornings and every single one of them <laughs> is just just takes you to to a whole new level um you i would, I would kind of add, i would add to that that it, it's not a it's not a back slapping environment where everybody's patting each other on the back and telling everybody what a great job everybody's doing yeah. you know there's a lot of accountability to be had um you know, I think, you know, like, I don't think that it's not that you get called out, but you could, your thinking or your thought processes can be questioned, um, which I, I think is helpful, certainly for me, um, to change the way that I think. Um, yeah. Because it's, you know, because nothing changes until I change the way that I, I think about something. So it's being in that environment where, you know there is accountability you know you can learn new ideas or, or new perspectives um which is a, a very interesting part of the whole process really and so to be honest it wouldn't be a fun thing for me to do if every time you went you came into the the map cafe and everybody was just patting everybody on the back telling each other how great everybody is because that's not that's not real life it's not like that um you know you're either you know, heading towards a storm, going through a storm, or just come out of a storm. Uh, and it's how you you deal with them and, and how we're able to share stories about those different things that may have happened to us, you know, the previous week or, or the previous day, or even that morning, um, that you can gain a, a better perspective and awareness, a situational awareness, to how you can react or respond differently to something the next time around. You know, I, somebody, somebody once said, um, I think it was, I, I think I was listening to, to Miles Monroe at some point and he said something, uh, to the effect that the, the biggest room is the room for self-improvement. And, uh, we've, I, I just find so many people are in the routine or the rut of life. You know, they get up on Monday morning. I think in your part of the world, it might be a case of rushing to the train or the bus stop. You go to work, you get to the office, you have your first cup of coffee, you go through the motions of the day and you <laughs> head back home, switch on the television, and in the morning you repeat the process. And people are almost got numb to that that uh, environment and, and seldom uh, question the things that they do or think deeply about... Uh, about life and maybe about this question of purpose. And I think, especially when we, what I've noticed is between the age of 35 and 55, that sort of age group are really asking the question. Um, and, uh, you know, you begin to realize that life isn't going to go on forever. So what am I actually going to do with those last years? In what way am I going to leave my mark? Or how am I going to have an impact or an influence? Um, these are these are things that I think the map cafe and and the bigger or the broader map club get you to think more deeply about. And tonight's questions in particular that Terence was uh, asking, um, and 
I don't know if you saw his comment earlier there uh, online. He he liked uh, something. Let me just post it there quickly so you can see it. <laughs> so that's Terence from Johannesburg, South Africa. Is spot on, Mick. Um, so so when it comes to to this this idea or question of purpose, what what are your um, have you have you got to that place where you have clarity in terms of purpose or vision, or have you learned something, uh, or are you pursuing uh, the answer? Of course, I have. Yes, you know because look, I'm a you know I'm a business owner. I've been a business owner for more than a decade and a half, and in fact, to be honest, I, you know, look, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, you know, you know, like. A, you know, I've got good confidence, you know, growing up, you know, I come from a, a good family that, you know, that supported me and encouraged me and everything else like this. Uh, and of course, you know, I was very successful as a, at a young age and worked my way up through construction to become, you know, a, a, you know, if there is such a thing, a director of a company, um, you know, before leaving construction, because I realized that my ladder to success, to success wasn't just leaning against the wrong wall. It was leaning, leaning against the wrong building. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't living my life. I was living my dad's life over again. You know, I became very aware of that. And, uh, you know, I, I started my own business. I went on to work with one of, one of the world's largest training and coaching companies in Dale Carnegie, um, which was an exciting time. 2009, then this big, huge recession came along, this massive trigger event for the whole world. And, of course, I ended up starting um, another business that my wife thought was a great idea. I didn't think it was a great idea. I was trying to get out of it. But today we own this this incredible business, you know, probably Ireland's largest, most recommended, most trusted in-home pet care company. We've delivered more than half a million pet care services to thousands of customers all over Ireland. Probably Europe's largest independently owned in-home pet care company. But then we had this another tr another trigger event recently, you know, with this pandemic, and of course, you know, I came to realize that, you know, that that what I thought I was in control of, I'm not in control of, and of course. You know, I realized that that business that, that I started, you know, and love and still love that it owns me. And, you know, and I decided that I was going to dynamically course correct my lifestyle and, and encourage others to do something similar. Um, so, yeah, you know, and of course, you know, I think about I think about, you know, purpose and things like this. And I think about lifestyle and a lifestyle with purpose and what that means to me and how I can communicate that message to others so that they can clearly define it for themselves. There's an interesting uh, concept that we've been sort of playing around with recently, and that's um, leading with purpose, you know, having, having that clarity of vision and, um, and almost in a sense, uh, taking the time to visualize a better future and then to fix our eyes on that and and start walking confidently in that direction, whether mm -hmm. other people are following or not, or whether the crowd is going in that direction or not. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of people who are listening to what you're saying this evening and saying, Mick, <laughs> give me some advice. You know, I, I, feel, I feel stuck. I feel trapped in my business. My business... I started. I was a I was a painter and um, or an artist. I loved painting. I decided to start my own gallery. Uh, now all I've got to, all I have every day is bills to pay, and uh, I'm trying to get people to come in the door to buy my paintings. And I've stopped painting. My business has become a prison. What advice are you going to give to someone in that position? I think if you, you know, just to use your example, if, you know, if it was somebody who, who was a, an artist or a painter or something, you know, is to paint, just, you know, do something that you love. I think that there are other ways to, to earn an income. Um, you know, so I don't, I think somebody who, you know, somebody who feels trapped, you know, you've got to make a change in your mind first. You know, I've got, I've got a little quote on my wall here from, Minister Fuller, Bob Proctor used it quite a lot. And he says, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, you have to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. You know, and, and you know, I think about that a lot. Yeah. And, and I think about how I can change, you know, I have to change, you know, because, you know, we do, we go through that, you know, work, go to work, go to sleep, 
you know, get up the next morning, go to work, come back, go to sleep, and you go through that routine. And unless you change that model of what you're doing, and it can start with the first thought that you have in the morning. And one of the things that, that I think that you can do is, you know, get up first thing in the morning and go out for a, you know, a brisk walk, maybe walking 25% faster. This is a great opportunity, you know, to, to clear your mind, use affirmations, you know, you know, use maybe, you know, gratitude affirmations or something, um, you know, you know, this breathing exercise that you can use to help really kind of cleanse your lungs. And, and of course, that brand new oxygen first thing in the morning goes straight into your brain. And it, and it can be quite a spiritual awakening in that sense for somebody very emo even emotional to somebody. But again, it's about it's about changing those habits, changing that routine. And of course, doing something different. You can, you know, in fact, one of the things that I would encourage anybody to do, if you're, if you, you know, like, you know, I know exactly how I feel, you know, you know, I'm trapped in this bigger hamster wheel, this hamster wheel that I created, you know, pre-COVID, we had over 400 people or nearly 400 people working for us all over the country. And every one of those 400 people, you know, they have problems, you know, they've got bills to pay, rent to pay, you know, if they get a puncture, they have to get that fixed. You know, that, that's their, 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 their problems. They bring those problems to me and expect me to solve them for them. You know, so my problems are bigger problems. You know, they're thinking about maybe paying a, a thousand euros rent. I'm thinking about paying a 10,000 pound wage bill, you know, or something like this. My problems are just, you know, exponentially bigger than somebody else's problems, um, but they're still problems never, nevertheless. But the truth is when I get up in the morning, you know, I want to focus my attention to exactly like Heather says, you know, to, to, you know, to try and serve others, you know, to shine in my service to others, to be the best that I can be. And of course, you know, you want to do that. And that comes across with every kind of um, atom in your in your body, you know, the tone of your voice, the, you know, the how your face looks, you know, even if, you know, if you could tell whether I'm happy or sad based on the tone of my voice. So, Whenever I'm in, in something else that other people say is that make me feel important. You know, whenever you're talking to somebody, listen to them, be empath empathic towards what their situation is, you know. But again, you know, if you can shine in your service to others, as, as Heather says, you know, that's beneficial to them and it's beneficial to you. And it, and it and I think that kind of comes back to you. You can feel good about that. I remember when I was in construction and I, I'd made a decision that I was going to leave construction. I didn't know when I was going to leave, but I, it was around Christmas 2002, and I said to my wife, Kay, I said, I'm gonna leave construction this year. And she said, when are you gonna leave? And I said, I don't know when I'm gonna leave. I just don't know, I'll know the day. I'll know on the day, you know? And I, I hadn't set a goal, but I said to my wife, I said, I'm gonna go back to work. I'm gonna be the best that I'm gonna be. You know, I'm just gonna be the best. I'm gonna be amazing, you know? Because I love construction, still love it today. You know, I can't walk past a hole without looking in it, to see what's going on. But I, I went back and I, you know, and I did, I was, I was very efficient. I was very thorough. And right up until the, the, the day that I was leaving, it was just, I woke up one day and I said, I'm leaving today, you know? And I just, I went into work and I said, look, I'm finished, I'm done. And I walked away. I didn't even know what I was gonna do, but I'm not suggesting anybody should do that. Okay, now you could make a decision that you're gonna, that you're gonna walk away from something, you know, but I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't just kind of get up today and just go and do that, you know? But obviously, I planted that that seed in my mind at this time that I was going to do that. I didn't know when I was going to do it by, but I knew I was going to do it. And then, you know, but of course, it was it was maybe ten months later that I just finished up. Um, but I, and I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but do you know what? God, it was a long time ago, maybe thirty odd years ago. A friend of mine gave me a book called The Magic of Thinking Big, right? And he and I was only. I was only 21 and I, I just, I'd literally just become a, a site agent for a construction company, one of Europe's largest constru construction companies. I was 21 years old and this guy gave me this book and he said, read chapter three and read chapter three first. And chapter three was about something, a disease called excusitis. And I read it and I thought, damn it. Now I've got to read the whole thing because he's going to ask me and I can't even make an excuse about it. Right. But that book started me on a personal journey in personal development. You know, I went on to, to read lots of different books, you know. So, you know, all of the popular ones 20 or 30 years ago, you know, Brian Tracy, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, 
you know, all the Ogmandino, Zig Ziglar, and all this kind of stuff. I've got a bookshelf full of them. Uh, you know, even, um, you know, the Rich Dad, Poor, Poor Dad series. Um, and of course, some of the personality profiles, which were really, really good, you know. Uh, and and that kind of set me on a journey. So I've been studying this stuff for, for, 30, for nearly 30 years. Um, and it, I don't think it... It doesn't make me any better than anybody else, you know, but it does it does make me more aware, you know, and and make me less reactive yeah. to situations. Um, and of course, you know, like we were on the call the other morning and I think um, Daryl was the speaker on the call. And it was very, you know, because obviously when people are talking, there's things that pop into your mind. And I was thinking, well, and. And the thing on Tuesday morning that popped into my mind was, you know, how do I know where I'm going if I don't know where I am? Yeah. So understanding where you are first, you know, because the truth is sometimes if you're, you know, like I can look at my situation and I can say, you know, that, you know, I've come to realize that this business that I love, this business that I own, that I started from scratch, from nothing, um, you know, and I love it. But it owns me, and you know, yeah, I can I can focus on that, and or I could say, well, maybe I've just fallen a little bit out of love with it. Maybe I need to fall back in love with what I, what it is that I do, you know, you know, yeah. are you good at what you do? Well, I, you know, I like to think I'm I'm great at what I do, you know, um, because of people like Heather Heather's influence, you know, to shine in your service to others. Now, there's one thing that. Whenever I think about serving other people, and, I, and, it, and it is about service, it's about serving somebody else, but that should never be mistaken with being submissive to somebody else. You know, it's not about that. You, can, you just want to be able to serve someone, give them an amazing experience of even if it's just communication, talking to them, you know, listening to them, understanding them. Um, and of course, as my wife tells me, sometimes she doesn't, she doesn't really want me to give her advice. She just wants me to listen to her. She doesn't want me to solve her problems. She just wants to be heard. And many people do. So, you know, listen, I'm expecting a hook or something to come and drag me away because I'm just talking too much now, right? No, Mick, you know, I, I was, what was fascinating is that the, the, the first book <laughs> that I read, I, I read 32 years ago, and it happened to be The Magic of Thinking Big. Mm. And it was just interesting because um, at that particular time, I'd, I'd finished my studies and uh, reading books was the furthest thing from my mind. I mean, you know, I'd, I'd had enough of Shakespeare <laughs> and the other books that we were forced to read uh, during our school years. And uh, somebody just said to me, you know, if, 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 you've got, if you've got a dream, if you want to go somewhere in life, maybe you should start reading something that's of value. And I, I picked up that book. And it was the first book that I read from cover to cover. Mm. And it inspired me to think differently. And I went on to read the other books um, that he wrote, The Magic of Thinking Success and The Magic of Getting What You Want. And then, of course, I, I also read uh, Dale Carnegie's uh, uh, books. Um, and I, I'm sure I was just thinking that your exposure to the, I don't know if it would be the Carnegie Foundation or whether it was actually the Carnegie Institute that was teaching or training people mm. um, because I, I came across them here in South Africa many years back as well. Um, what, what, was, what was your big learning from, from your time with the Dale Carnegie uh, group? I think it's just, to be honest, it's just about attitude. It's just about, you know, it's just an attitude. That's all it is. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's a, it's a way of thinking. That's, that's, there's nothing else to it. Um, and it's, it's really just about empowering and helping whoever it is that, that, you know, when someone comes to that organization, they're only coming there because they've got a problem that they need to get solved. That's yeah. all it is. And, and, it's, and in fact, it's the same in any organization. It doesn't matter whether it's Dale Carnegie or whether it's my company. Somebody mm -hmm. comes to me, it's because they, they've got a problem that needs to get solved. Um, and of course, you, you know, like our job, regardless of the industry that you're in, is to help someone feel better about something that makes them feel bad. That's it. 
I love that. I love that. that well, that's oh, just, all. Just, just, just repeat that again. <laughs> Help them right. feel better about something they feel bad about. Yeah, that's all it is. And yeah. that's even in our company. When, in fact, when you know, you know, I learned a long time ago, right, in construction, and I learned that. I'd, even though our job was to build something or to make something or to build a wall or, you know, put in some pipes or whatever else, that was the task that we were performing. My job was to make my client look really good. Yeah. Right. That was my job. It, you know, it wasn't about what we did, you know, or, you know, we knew what to do and we knew how to do it and we had all the materials, but it was to, it was to make, you know, the person who was asking us to, to do this was to make them feel good about that whole process. And if I could make them feel good, to be honest, I could literally get away with murder. Yeah. I'm not saying that you should do that, you know, get away with murder. But if you can help feel somebody, you know, be better about something or even, you know, when, when people come to, to, to my company to, to, you know, because they're going on holiday or, and they want someone to look after their dog or their cat or their horses or whatever it is. You know, that's just the task that we're performing for them. What we're really doing is helping them feel better about a situation that they that's out of control in their life, that they don't have a solution for, they don't have an option for. And even though they may have done something in the past, you know, like when I'm whenever I'm talking to customers, I, you know, I always say, look, you know, there's kennels that you can use. There's catteries that you can use. You can ask friends and family. You can even find other people out there who will do this and they'll all do it, but they won't do it like us. You know, why is that? Because our job is to help you feel better about a situation that makes you feel bad. Looking after you, looking after your pet is just the task that we do. What we really do is help you feel like the best pet owner in the world. Who doesn't want to feel like that? You know, and that's where we focus all our attention in serving that person, giving them an amazing experience. Uh, and of course, you know, even when even when I'm going into a restaurant and, you know, that server is coming to me, I want to give that server an amazing experience. And when I do that for them, what kind of service do you think I get in return? Amazing service. You know, I don't have to wait for anything. They just bring it to me because I'm I'm giving, you know, I'm, I'm helping their experience of serving me by serving them in return. You know, so I think, you know, there's no doubt that I've learned a lot, certainly from Heather. She's very wise. You know, and I, I know that she would claim not to know it all, but, you know, she's an inspiration. You know, Mick, Mick you, you, what you're doing this evening is, uh, and for people that are going to watch this recording, uh, is giving a fresh perspective, in fact, a new perspective on, on some things. And I, I was reminded of a... Uh, a, an illustration that was shared with me some years ago of two two guys working in one of these quarries in your part of the world, <laughs> and they were busy chipping away at sandstone, and and the one was asked, uh, "What are you doing?" And he kind of looked up disgruntled, and he said, well, "What do you think? I'm making making bricks, <laughs> or or these these stone bricks." And he turned to the the person next to him and said, "What are you doing?" So he said, "I'm building a cathedral." Mm. And, uh, you know, both were doing exactly the same task, but the understanding of the task was vastly different. And, yeah. and what you've shared today, if we can just change our perspective and take our eye off the task and look at the bigger picture or the purpose behind it, then we will be energized. I think we'll be starting every day like Tuesday morning, <laughs> feeling invigorated ready to get out there and uh, make a difference in someone else's life. And I think when I, when I was just sort of reflecting back a little bit on Dale Carnegie, the one thing that um, I, I, I think I began to consider after going through the book that he, that he wrote, uh, I, I did try and implement some of those things mechanically or you know, follow the rules. But what I realized is that like you were talking about your wife earlier, is is really being ready to put the other person first, um, instead of you know always about me, myself, and I. Just just take the a focus off myself for a moment onto the other person, and when I do that, my perspective is transformed, 
and in the process the other person is uh, feels like a new person uh, they, they they get a new lease of life mm. um, you certainly yeah. made me feel like that this evening um, so well, I, see, I see our time is uh, is we've got we've got another five minutes um, so I'm not going to ask a question because I can see you've got something to say. <laughs> so. Well, no, I was, you know, I, I was just thinking there, you know, about perspective. And lots of times it really is about perspective when you're having a conversation with somebody. You know, for a long time, you'd be talking to someone and you're actually, and I'm actually maybe thinking more about what it is that I want to say next before I've even heard what they're what it is that they're saying yeah and of course you know sometimes you know we can be we can be standing in front of each other looking at the same the same situation and in fact to be honest a better example of this is my dog right got a little dog called joey and joey understands perspective right he does because if i'm eating something and I'm sitting right here, you know, he'll come and sit right in front of me. And he'll, he'll be watching me eat it and he'll be waiting for me to give him something, you know, and he'll wait a certain amount of time and then he'll change his position, right? <laughs> because by changing his position, he'll get a different outcome. Yeah. And that's what it's about. It's about outcomes. Even in a conversation, you know, somebody wants an outcome. You know, and you and I could be having a conversation and I can change that outcome by changing my position, even just by changing your position. Because if I, you know, even if you and I were even in um, a quarrel, let's say, and, yes. you know, I could change my position, maybe forcing you to change your position, you know, and that could change the outcome of the conversation, you know, or sometimes you can be standing having a conversation with somebody and you know the sun could be shining on their face and you can see that they're having difficulty dealing with that i could change my position right away to to block that sun from them and that that conversation changes almost immediately because their distraction is gone you know so i think sometimes changing your position can change the perspective for somebody else and even for yourself uh, on a conversation yeah, if you and I are standing face to face having a conversation, talking about something behind me, well, only you can see it. I can't see it. But if I change my position and we're both facing that same direction, well, then now we can both do the same thing, right? And we can, you know, start to discuss different things about that view, you know, not you just trying to describe it to me. And, and I think I think this is what, what you're talking about right now is is going to help people that are stuck. <laughs> um, you know, when when I say stuck, sometimes you you're facing a problem. Well, we love to give these things names: problems, situations, circumstances, challenges, issues. <laughs> the list goes on. But somebody might be in that place right now, and your your advice that you've just given of just making a shift. Uh, you know, maybe a shuffle, a shuffle to the left or to the right or or doing a, an about turn or asking somebody that you have never thought of asking before. Even sometimes we're always looking up. We want to go to the CEO and ask them a question. Maybe we could turn around and ask the, the, the tea lady uh, 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 and maybe they've got the answer because they've been through a similar situation before. And uh, or perhaps even your child. <laughs> Sometimes our children have answers that can really help us get unstuck. Um, well, Glenn, you know, when I was when I was in construction and I learned at an early age, right? You know, I was maybe 15 years, left school at 15, digging holes in the road. My dad was in construction and my dad's my hero, right? I love my dad. I just wanted to do what my dad did. He didn't want me to do it, but I, you know, I wanted to be around him. And, you know, I thought I knew everything at 15 right as you do you're a young guy and you know my dad would watch me and he'd watch me do stuff wrong and then he'd make me do it over again and i'd question and argue with him for a while and then he then i'd just have to do it you know and then i came to realize that when i thought about doing stuff i would stop and i'd say how would my dad want me to do this right and then 
instead of doing it the way I thought, I would think about he, how he would tell me to do it. And more often than not, I was right. And then as I got older, you know, I would have conversations with, you know, somebody who was maybe super smart. I'm only talking about conversations in my head, you know, and I would ask that question. Like if I came up against a problem and I didn't know how to do it, I would ask myself, well, you know, how would Henry Ford look at this problem? You know, how would, um, you know, how would Glenn deal with this? How would Glenn answer this question? If I asked this question to Glenn, how would Glenn answer this question? How would, if I was asking this question, if I came up against this problem, and um, how would, you know, Terence suggest that I deal with this issue? Yes. And it changes my level of thinking. It opens my mind to different possibilities and just takes me away from the things and, and, and thoughts that I just habitually churn over. So asking myself that question, a different question, if I did know how to do it, how would I do it? If I did know how to solve this problem, I, you know, the first thing that always pops into my mind is I'd avoid it, right? I'd just avoid it. It's probably not even going to be a problem. My wife, Kate, I love her to bits, right? She saved me. Um, but Kate would often worry about things. You know, in fact, about 30 years ago, this is how, this, this is how I figured this out. I was, we were living in a, in a place called Warrington in the northwest of England. And we were living in this terraced house and, you know, the street was right outside and somebody had parked a BMW 7 Series right outside my house. And a friend, a friend of mine was there. And I kept looking out the window to see if this BMW, and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just checking this BMW, you know, to make sure it's all right. You know, I don't want anything to happen to it. He says, is it your BMW? I said, no. He said, well, what are you worried about it for? And I thought, why am I worried about it? It's got nothing to do with me. And most of the time, you spend time burning this energy, worrying about stuff that's either got nothing to do with you, that are circumstances that you're creating in your mind, manifesting them in the future. It's true. It's going to happen if you think about it enough. You're going to, you're going to manifest that problem. So the best thing to do is to avoid that problem. Just avoid it. Ask yourself a different question. If I knew how to avoid that, how would I avoid that? If I knew how to solve that problem, how would I solve that problem? Or, and if you can't come up with it, ask somebody else. Well, you know, how would Glenn solve this problem? How would Heather solve this problem? You know, what would they do differently to what I'm doing? And it just gives you different ways of thinking about it. You know, you don't have, you're only stuck in here. You know, that's six inches between the ears. That's the only place where you get stuck. And if you get stuck, the only way that you can, you know, to get through it is to absolutely go through it. That's all you can do. You know what I what I love about what you're saying is when I when I look at you, Nick, <laughs> I've got a, I've got I've got a message for you, and that is that I cannot see any obstacles in your life whatsoever. <laughs> and so, um, you know, all of the obstacles that we have, one could say, are imagined obstacles. And uh, I, I remember you were talking about digging holes, um, and I was just thinking of the. Uh, about about ten years ago, I think it was. I was I was busy imagining something bad happening in my life in the future, and I was literally <laughs> digging a hole for myself. And and suddenly one day I just woke up and I realized, you know, I'm actually creating the very thing that I don't want. Mm. And I changed my thinking. And in that instant of changing my thinking, changing my perspective that hole that I was busy digging just vanished. <laughs> it wasn't there anymore. And so uh, I think that uh, uh, the one thing that, I, that I've said is when you abu abuse imagination, it is spelled W-O-R-R-Y. And uh, we love to worry about things that are beyond our control or that aren't even necessary to think about. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for, for being on the show this evening and sharing uh, your words. I've been truly encouraged, and I feel I feel a much better person now that I've been listening to you <laughs> than before the show started. So thank you so much for your time. I uh, wish you everything of the best going forward, and I hope to see you on this space more frequently. Uh, we would love to hear more of the wisdom that you have to share. So, Mick, thank you so much. And um, thanks for the opportunity. If there's, a, if there's a last word from, from your side before we end the show, well, thank you for the opportunity. It was completely unexpected, um, which is 
the best way for it to be, right? Um, Amen. You know, so no, uh, thank you uh, for taking the time to have a conversation with me and to ask me questions. Um, you know, obviously, I'm happy to talk about my experiences. Uh, and they are just experiences. And of course, those experiences that I've had have made me the person that I am today. But, you know, that doesn't mean to, to say that, you know, I can't change and become a better person tomorrow or even right now. You know, I don't have to rely on those experiences that have made me into the person that I am to, 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 to keep on being that same person. I think a friend of mine would say, you know, if you get 1% better every day, it's like 365% better a year. You know, that's a lot. That's a big increase, right? Yeah. So I think if you can get 1% better just every day, just with, with something, with a little thing, just, you know, a, a, you know, it's funny because I heard that, that, you know, that, you know, you have 80,000 thoughts a day, right? That just run through your mind. You don't even know that you're having them. And most of them are repetitive. You had them yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before and the day before, you know? So like, I'm sure that you've looked at uh, neurological NLP, neurological path pathways and programming and stuff like this. You know, that's definitely something that people could, could you know, try and understand a little bit. And one of the, I, I think one of the books, uh, that Heather brought up the other day that, that we were reading was a book called How to Break the Habit of Being Yourself by Dr. Joe Dispenza. That's an incredible book. It's a, a, a you know, if anybody's really looking to, to make a, a shift, you know, there's exercises in there that could really, really help, you know, with somebody. But you've got to be open and you've got to want to help yourself. Yeah. Don't be a victim. That's all I would say. <laughs> Mick, this has been this has been fantastic. And uh, what, you probably were really worried. You were probably really worried because I could have come on and I could have been effing and blind in. I could have been doing anything, saying all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Oh, but I have faith in you. <laughs> but uh, Mick, Mick, you've, you've really you've just you've just reminded us that the choices we make today shape our tomorrow, yes, and where we where we are right now really has no reflection on where we could be. Um, thank you so much for that. Have a thank wonderful you. evening further to everyone else every Wednesday evening and Thursday evening, 7 p.m. South African time or 5 p.m. GMT, which happens to be 6 p.m. at the moment, is it? Uh, something like that. So you shifted your clocks the other day to try and catch up with us here in South Africa. Um, well, um, what time is it there with you? Is it 9 with you? It's, it's 8 p.m. Where, right. where we are right now. Yeah, it's 10 past 7 here now. So obviously it starts at 6, right? There we go. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll close out with a short ad. Bye-bye. Thank you.